This is Dr. Karen, and you are listening to the DeFacto Leaders Podcast, where I help pediatric therapists and educators become better leaders so they can make a bigger impact with their services. With over 15 years of experience supporting school-age kids with diverse learning needs, I'll share up-to-date evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help clinicians, teachers, and aspiring school leaders feel more confident in the way they serve their students and clients. I'll cover a range of topics designed to help you support students' emotional and academic growth and set kids up for success in adulthood, including how to support language, literacy, executive functioning, as well as how to help IEP teams working together to support kids across the day. Whether you want to learn more effective strategies for your therapy sessions or classroom, be a more influential leader on your team, or find creative ways to use your skills to advance in your career, I've got you covered. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 112 of the DeFacto Leaders Podcast. In this episode, I have special guest Jethro Jones, who is a national award-winning former school leader, podcaster, and author of books such as How to Be a Transformative Principal and School X, How Principals Can Design a Transformative School Experience for the People Right in Front of Them. He is also the founder of the Bead Podcast Network, which I am a part of, which is the best educational podcast network out there. Jethro currently consults school leaders on strategies to help them save time, lead more effectively, and overcome their own weaknesses. And he has worked as a principal at all K-12 levels, including a prison school, also working as a district coach, distance learning team lead, and an English teacher. In this conversation, we get into a number of really powerful topics, such as how to lead up to your school administrator when they need your input on programming decisions, even if they don't realize they need your input yet. Also, how to lead out to other people on your team if they're resistant to changing their practices, and how to make a case to your school leader for more resources and support, even if they're telling you that it's not in the budget. That's something that comes up a lot, especially when people are asking for things like professional development. So they might say, I only have this many dollars to spend on professional development. And we actually get into that topic in this episode of how you can make a case for getting what you need, even if it isn't technically within what you think is the budget. And we also talk about how this impacts some programming decisions, such as staff resources as well. If you've ever felt like your school administrator doesn't fully understand your role and your expertise, or if you feel like you have information and knowledge that they need in order to drive important decisions for your school, and you want them to listen to your input, this is going to be a really important episode for you. It often feels like your boss or even your boss's boss has all the power, but actually that isn't always the case because you can really step into a leadership role now and be an advisor to those people who are technically your superiors. That's this concept of leading up, which we get into in this episode. So if you would like to feel more empowered in your role, if you'd like to be in a position where you have more input into programming decisions, or just so you can get more support for the role that you're currently in, then you're definitely not going to want to miss this episode. Before we get started, I wanted to mention a free training that I have been working on. I've actually released several versions of this training. This is the training that explains some of the courses and trainings that I offer in the School of Clinical Leadership, which is a program for school clinicians, so speech pathologists, social workers, psychologists, counselors, occupational therapists. So anybody who's in that related service provider role, and you want to learn how you can get your team on board with providing executive functioning support across your students' day so that you can be proactively supporting mental health, academic growth, and social skills, then the School of Clinical Leadership is for you. And I came out with a free training 
that shares the overview of what's in the program and some key shifts that you can make in setting up these supports for your building. So the free training has been revamped a few times. Currently, the title of the training is how to provide academic and social skills support in a way that is evidence-based and neurodiversity affirming. So this is a topic that comes up a lot, has a lot of nuance, a lot of people understand that they need to support neurodiversity, but at the same time, they're not really sure what that means. So in this free training, I aim to clear up some of that confusion and give you a tangible way that we can both support neurodiversity, but also give kids the skills that they need in order to be resilient so we can set them up for success in adulthood. So to learn more about that training, you're gonna to wanna to go to drkarendudekbrandoncom backslash EF leadership. And again, this free training is going to show you the components of intervention that need to be in place to support students' independent functioning and how you can do it feasibly on a school team. And then for those of you who wanna learn more, I do mention the School of Clinical Leadership at the end. And I will say, if you think that your district is providing executive functioning support, but your students are still struggling to complete work, if they're still refusing and avoiding challenging tasks, if they are having a difficult time relating to peers and persisting through complex tasks, then chances are you might have some of the solution in place, but not all of it. And so this free training is going to help clear up some confusion so that you know where to intervene. Again, to learn more about this free training, you're gonna to wanna to go to drkarendudekbrennan.com backslash EF leadership. Now, please enjoy this interview with Jethro Jones from The Transformative Principle. Today, I am joined by Jethro Jones from the Transformative Principle Podcast. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Hey, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and so excited to talk with you. Can you share a little bit about your background, what you're working on right now, and how you got to where you are? Yeah, so I uh, started out as an English teacher. Then I became a distance learning and media technology team lead in my district, which is a long way to say that I dealt with libraries and distance learning way back before the pandemic started. Then I became a curriculum specialist and then an assistant principal. I was a principal in Alaska then for six years um, and did all levels of K-12, including a prison school, which was a unique and different experience. And um, somewhere along the line, I started my podcast, Transformative Principal, and have been interviewing people on there for about a decade. And I really enjoy doing that. And it helps me a lot. And then um, a couple of years or a year ago, I started the B Podcast Network, which you're a member of as well. It's the best place to get education podcasts. So check that out, bpodcastnetwork.com. Got to always put a plug in for that, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and now I coach uh, school leaders and people aspiring to be school leaders um, in how to lead their schools more effectively. Great. What are some things that you're working on right now? I know you are involved with a company called School AI. You're you're a lot, you're yeah. really involved with some of the up and coming trends in education. Yes. Um, so School AI is a company that I'm working with and they're developing a way to make it easy for teachers to do the busy work uh, so that they can spend more time focusing on relationships, which I'm super excited about. And uh, you were one of our guests on one of the workshops that we did, which was awesome. So um, on YouTube, look for School AI and Karen Dudek Brandon, and you'll find her session, which was great. Um, and then I have always have my things in a lot of, always have my fingers in a lot of different things, is what I meant to say there. Yeah. And and so the podcast network, and then I'm currently doing a, a workshop, which we'll talk about here for helping people move up in their careers. And that doesn't just mean get a new job, but also means move up in responsibility and ability and opportunity. Great. So we're going to get into a conversation about coaching today. What are some 
high points and some key takeaways that we want to think about as we're listening to this conversation? Yeah. Well, first at the end, I'm going to share a uh, a quiz that you can take. And so if you like what you hear, then you should take the quiz. If you don't like what you hear, then you should stop listening and find another podcast. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just stop listening to this interview. Come back for Karen's next guest. Um, that's that's the important thing. Um, one of the things that I think is really valuable and was was an aha in in this conversation is making it easy for other people to say yes to what you want. And I think that if you have that mindset, whenever you're faced with a problem is, how do I make a yes easy for this other person? Just that would be a valuable takeaway from listening to this podcast today. Great. Well, let's get into it. So a lot of people in education feel like other people, the person on the other side of the table has all the power. Can you talk about that a little bit and how it relates to the work that you do? No, uh, this is such a fantastic, exciting perspective because everybody thinks that somebody else has the power and that we're powerless to do to do the things that we want to do and that we need to get permission from someone or be picked or chosen by someone to be able to do the things that we're trying to do. And the reality is, is that we have all the power that we need already, no matter what position we're in. So let's take, for example, you're a lot of the people that uh, are listening to this are therapists, uh, like speech language or physical or occupational therapists, or in a role where they're, they don't really feel like they, like they have all the information or all the decision-making power. But if you are a speech language pathologist and you go into an IEP meeting, and you say, this is what needs to happen for this student. You, because you're, because you are who you are and know what you know, people are going to say, okay, that's, we can probably take what she's saying and go with it. And the thing is, if you actually come with a plan and a strategy for doing what you're trying to do, then nobody is, nobody's taking the time to think about these things besides you. And so if you have an idea and you have a plan, then you can you can go with it. So let me illustrate this with a very simple example okay. from my 11-year-old daughter who is dying to have a phone. She just thinks that it's like the coolest thing in the world and totally wants one. And let me just tell you, there's no way in the world that she's getting a phone. <laughs> so she feels like she has no power in this situation. So she came to me the other day and she said, dad, I have an idea from the old uh, like flip phone that we have that uh, that we used to use when the kids would go to different activities and events and things like that. Um, I'm going out on bike rides with my friends a lot, and I would like to be able to have this phone just to take with me when I go on these things so that I have a way to get in touch with you guys um, as as needed now. She thinks like what she really wants is an iPhone, like a lot of her friends have. She's not getting an iPhone, but what she might get is an opportunity to be able to stay in contact with us. And because she is taking control of the situation and saying, I have this idea and I want to do it. She is now taking control and saying, I do have the power to make some decisions. And because I'm suggesting it, then I'm going to be responsible with what I'm asking to be able to do. That's a lot different than me saying, okay, I need you to do this. And so now you do what I tell you to do. She's saying, I'm showing how I'm responsible, how I'm resourceful and how I have good ideas. And I think that I can do this and make, make things better for you as parents and better for me. Now she's 11 years old, but she's starting to figure some of these things out that when you come with the idea, and, and here's the key. It took me a long time to get to this, but here's the key. Make it easy for someone else to say yes. Oh, yeah. That's a big one. <laughs> it is a big one. If you make it difficult for them to say yes, then they're going to say no. But if you make it easy for them to say yes by coming prepared, having a plan, and putting things in place that make it easy for them to just say, yeah, we can do that, no problem, then you solve a lot of your problems and you actually do 
have all the power because all they're doing is saying yes. They're not saying, let's work on this together and figure it out. Mm -hmm. That part that you said there that make it easy for them to say yes. How often do you, when you've been working with people in the schools or healthcare or wherever, where there's some type of a position where there's a leader and then there's someone who is reporting to them asking for something or who feels like they're not, that they don't have autonomy with something. How often do you see people making it very difficult for those people in the leadership positions to say yes or give them what they're asking for? What are some specific examples that you've seen? Yeah, this this is huge because so many times people say, I want to do this, um, give me permission. And what they really need to be saying is, here's how all of this is going to work and how it's going to benefit you. Should I go ahead and do this and give you these benefits or should I do something else? When you ask the question like that, should I go ahead and give you these benefits? Then it's really easy for someone to say, yes, I want those benefits. Yes, I want to have that happen. It's it's really a piece of cake. It's not challenging. On the other hand, when you come and say, for example, here's a, here's a classic example. Um, a, a teacher at my school wants to go or a therapist at my school wants to go to a conference. Mr. Jones, I want to go to this conference. And can I go? And it's like, okay, well, how much does it cost? What are the what are the things you're going to get from it? How are you going to bring this back to our school? Contrast that with the uh, the SLP that I had who wanted to go to a conference. And she said, Jethro, here's this conference that I want to go to. This is how much it costs. There is a grant available that I would apply for. And if I get it, then it would be free. If I present, then it'll be free. So you wouldn't have to pay for that. And uh, the per diem is this. And the um, I would need a sub, but I've actually already arranged all my uh, students to be to not meet those two days so that I can go to this. And I'll, um, I'll, I'll make sure that I get them all in on the rest of the days in the week so I can still meet their service hours. And, um, and if I go to this, then it will help me do this part of my job better which has been a challenge for us in our school. And here's how it'll be easier. And so all I really need is your signature here to say, yes, it's okay for me to take this time and go do this. Like, okay. Like, yeah. it's really easy for me to say yes to that SLP as opposed to the the teacher who's like, I need to go to this conference. And then I've got to do all this work on top of it to figure mm-hmm. out whether or not that's worthwhile. Right. Yeah. That's a that's a really great example because I know that some people that professional development and getting access to those types of things that people want to build their skills is a huge thing. And I think that sometimes people sometimes people think, well, my administrator won't let me do this or my school only offers this much budget for this this much PD. And then they just stop there. And I Mm -hmm. always wonder, is that really what, is that really what the rules are? Have you tried? Have you looked for solutions? And I've seen it with, with PD. I've also seen it with things like, um, with some of the special ed things. And what happens specifically with, with speech is that sometimes there would be, these are our policies for the special ed teachers and that how it would apply to the related service providers like the social worker, the speech pathologist, the psychologist, because their role is a little bit different, but related to teachers, it wouldn't necessarily directly apply. So the administrator is coming here who's kind of taken a first stab at these are our policies and procedures. It's like a first draft. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to put this out there because I need to give you some direction on how to do things. And people take that as it as if it's the final draft and there's no flexibility in it and when i was in the schools a lot of times what we would do is you know it's like okay here's how we want you to do it but there's all these little nuances that that administrator hasn't necessarily taken into account because they haven't been in my role and a lot of times if we would just say okay i, I understand why you are recommending this but what if we did it this way? And then, like you said, here's all of these procedures lined up for us. It's easy for them to say yes or no versus 
well, this just doesn't work for me. This just doesn't make sense. And then asking them to do all of that work. So I've seen yeah. it that way as well, where sometimes the administrator is thinking about it from one angle and it doesn't make sense, but really there is another way and they would be willing to accept it. They just, they haven't come up with the idea yet because they haven't yeah. been in your shoes. Yeah, that that's exactly it. And so, especially with someone who is a singleton in a, in a school or, or work environment where nobody else has that same job, um, the policies are not written for the singleton. The policies are written for the majority, the, yeah. the mass of people who have the same job. So in this situation, you have to recognize that everything's negotiable uh, and you should be ready and willing and able to negotiate for what you specifically need. But then there's no way that every policy we have can cover every situation. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. finding loopholes and finding ways to get the things that you need to have happen is a powerful way to do it. That that makes a lot of sense, but is not always easy to implement because it's so much easier to convince yourself that the other person is going to say no before you ever even give them the chance to say yes. And that's more of a mindset issue than it is a a practical issue because your your mind is telling you, I can't do this yet. It's not going to work. Um, they're going to have this reason. And so you just take, take a couple extra minutes and think through how you answer those questions. Yes, for them and make it easy for them to say yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful. I think a lot of times if people would take the extra step and think about that and maybe even try it once and just see that it works, that could be huge for them. Because I think mm -hmm. sometimes just having a little bit of success with it gives them the confidence to try it again. Yeah. And, and start with something small. You know, this is, this is a skill that can be practiced and honed, making it easy for people to say yes. And so start with something small that you want to get that you can see as a victory for you that they won't even know is something that you are, that you are trying to get. And so you practice with these little things. Now, let me give an example. Uh, let's say that there is, um, that there's a form that you've got to fill out all the time, for example. And you don't want to fill this form out because it's annoying and pointless and nobody's ever paying attention to it. And so what can you do to make it so that you don't have to fill that form out? What, what is the information that is really needed for that? And how can you deliver that in a different way that doesn't have to be on that form specifically? And can you get away with not filling out the form just one time and getting what you need or what you want or what the, the person who's requiring the form actually wants. This is a very low risk, easy way to play a game and enjoy trying to work the system in a way that makes it so that you can get what you need. And it's totally silly, Karen, but it's it's actually a lot of fun to start with something like that, that doesn't really matter that and just see if you can figure out a way around it. Oh man, I would, I would do that all the time with IEPs. <laughs> I can think of a couple situations where I was like, what would happen if I didn't do this? And you know what? I, it never, the world never ended and it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was a situation with, with IEPs where there was this extra little step that this administrator was recommending that we do. It did not make any sense. And so I just didn't do it. And her response was, I see you didn't do this thing that I asked, uh -huh. but what if we did it this way? And we came up with a totally different, more reasonable way to do things. And it was yeah. something with, she wanted us to get I, approval for IEPs, where if you have 11 students on your caseload, then maybe you can do that. If you have 60 students on your caseload, you can't really get approval for every IEP before mm -hmm. you set up the meeting. So it made more sense for me to just send it in and her just kind of check over it. And so it was, it was a lot more efficient that way. So yeah, I, I love yeah. the loophole idea because. Yeah. And, and what I love about your example there is that she had a reason for doing it that didn't necessarily apply to you personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there, there are a lot of things that we do that like we set policies and procedures and, and the way we do things uh, so that it's easy for that person. Now, like uh, job interviews and sending in resumes and things like that, 
those things are horrible for the applicant because they're so opaque. You don't know anything that's going on. And it's a total pain, no matter what you are doing. Anybody who's ever looked for a job, especially their first job in any new field, knows that that is totally an awful experience. Mm -hmm. Fill out hundreds of applications with much the same information, but all phrased differently. So you really have to like do them differently. And and it's a total pain. But the thing that's amazing is that once you start changing your mindset and seeing how you have power in the situation, you can start being invited to apply instead of actually applying. And there's a very different feel and experience when that is happening um, than there is when you're just like going through the motions and trying to meet everybody else's needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a very good example because I know that a lot of people are trying to make career shifts right now in education and mm-hmm. it can feel very disempowering to be on the side of let me just fill out all these applications and I have no idea what's going on and you know maybe a person sees my application or maybe yeah. I just get booted from the system. So with I know you do a lot of work with coaching. And there are different needs with all these different people who are working in the schools, just the whole concept of coaching, what it is, who can do it, who needs it, how they need it. Uh, There's a lot of things to discuss there. So I guess let's just dive right into that. Let's just start off with what do you mean by coaching? How does it apply to this field? Well, I think that everybody needs a coach. Um, I have a coach. In fact, one of my coaches is one of my former teachers who was a special ed teacher, and she is coaching me on losing weight right now. And I, I, when I found out that she was a coach for this, I was like, sign me up instantly because I knew she was a dynamite teacher, a great human being and somebody that I would want to be accountable to. And so it was easy for me to go to her for this thing, even though she was technically a subordinate to me before. And a lot of times that can make weird situations of I'm now going to this person that used to be my subordinate to coach me and I'm going to be vulnerable with her. Well, that actually is appealing to me because she knows what I was like as her leader and knows the things that motivate me and what is um, interesting and appealing to me. And so I can go to her and say, here are the things that I'm struggling with. What can I do to be better? So uh, since I've started this, I've been able to lose 35 pounds, which is awesome. And it feels great. And let me tell you, Karen, I am sure that if I didn't have a coach helping me with this, then I wouldn't be successful in doing it. And so like I have coaches for my business um, or Uh, I have a couple coaches for my business. I'm trying to decide which one I like best (laughs) because that sounds very familiar. (laughs) Yeah. Cause I need to narrow it down. And, and, and then I had as a principal, I had coaches that I would go to and um, my podcast transformative principle is really what I, what I used as my coach that I would, I would use that podcast to get specific answers to the questions that, that I was struggling with in the moment and hear what people were doing and keep going back again and again to figure out how to be better. Now, no matter what position you're in, you you need someone who can speak some wisdom into your life and help you see things that are blind to you. And that that matters a lot. And no matter where you're at, you need that. No matter where you're at in a school also, you need to provide coaching to people on how to help them help you do your job better. And so especially for related service providers or special ed teachers, you need to help the other teachers and your principal know how to help you be most effective in your job. And and they can't uh you can't let them get away with just uh thinking that they know best and and not giving that coaching support uh in the moment, which can be very challenging, especially when you have to coach up uh, or as I call it, lead up to your mm. your person ahe- above you. That can be very challenging. Yeah. Okay. So that's a really interesting. There's so many different things that we could go into with what you just said. But since you ended the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that thought on leading up, 
Can you explain what that means and how someone who is directly working with students might apply that to their situation? Yeah. So the first thing that I talked about, about making it easy for people to say yes, is where I would start with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what you want to do is part of your coaching is making it easy for that person to say yes. And if you start there, then it's going to make everything else much easier. The second part of that is finding ways for them to pay attention to the things that matter to you not okay. pay attention to the things that matter to them. Yeah. So for example, um, principals need to make sure that the whole school is safe and running sound and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's all fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. um, but you as a, a service provider or as a special ed teacher, you have things that are important to you and you need to find a way to make those things important to your principal as well. And the best way to do that is to phrase what you need to have happen in a way that makes them have success in what they're doing as well. So yeah. he, here's an example. Um, so let's say you're a special ed teacher and you're working uh, with some very behaviorally challenged students who have poor behavior and it's a struggle all the time and you need extra support. If your principal is focused on making sure the school is running safe and sound and, and that everybody's feeling good about things and there's a good culture, then you go to the principal and use their goals to help you get the support that you need. And so, for example, if if you have five kids in, in one resource classroom and they're, they're all there at the same time and it's a lot of stress and 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 it's difficult every single day, and you need another body in there, it's pretty tough to justify getting a second person into a room where there's only five kids when other teachers have 30 kids in there. Mm -hmm. And and that's just a reality. But the thing is, is that if you can say, if I have an extra person in here, and having this extra person will decrease the number of referrals that these five kids get, because we all know they're the frequent flyers who are getting this stuff happening all the time. And I can have an extra person there. I can work closer with them and help them with their behavior changes that they need to make um, in a more systematic and effective way. You can get, you know, an aide or a co-teacher or something to happen to where you actually have that support. Now, the reason I bring up that example is because I was really big as a principal on having teachers do co-teaching and having uh, small class sizes and figuring out ways to get the student to adult ratio even lower. And, and so I had a situation like this and the teacher was asking for something that I felt like was impossible. So she came to me with the data of what these kids were, of how much trouble they were getting in, in all their other classes and said, if I have one more person with me in here, I bet I can decrease them getting in trouble in these other classes because I'll be able to teach them the skills they need to be successful. Now, I didn't know that that was actually true, but she made it easy for me to say yes and aligned her goals with my goals. And so it was easy for me to then say, all right, let's give it a shot and see how it works. Even though it was a big ask and it was definitely something that was... uh not a typical thing that we would do, mm -hmm. but she, she figured out a way to make it seem like it would be stupid for me to not say yes to it. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a good example. That is definitely something that comes up a lot with special ed where the, even with certain students who do they need a one-on-one -on -one aid? Do you need another person in this classroom when there's all these other needs? that the just the the human resources aspect of it i think that if you haven't been in a position where you're responsible for hiring and thinking about how to allocate staff it's just your head is in a different place to a mm -hmm. teacher it seems like okay well, obviously we're struggling here i have these human beings these tiny human beings in front of me and we need help and all those other things aren't really on your mind because you have just this hair on fire thing going on in front yeah. of you, but really you can't ignore the logistics of what you're asking as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and that is a very true thing. One of the things that I, that I talk about in the workshops that I do um, is when you are, when you are ready to move up in your career, you start seeing things beyond the fires that are in front of you Mm -hmm. and you start seeing the bigger picture. And this, I think is one of the most challenging things for people who are trying to, to move up to a higher level of, um, of authority or position or whatever the case may be, is that every teacher sees her classroom as her whole world. Mm -hmm. And every principal sees her school as her whole world. And every uh, curriculum director, special ed director sees their department as their whole world. Every superintendent sees their district as their whole world. Every state superintendent sees their whole state as their whole world. And it just, you have these blinders. Yeah, Yeah. These blinders on that. You just see what's in front of you. And one of the great skills that you can learn as you're leveling up is how do I see the bigger picture and how I fit into this bigger idea of what we're trying to do here. And the teachers that are most successful, the special educators and the service providers that are most successful at this are able to see how everything that they touch is part of this bigger system. And it's not always easy to do that, but it's very essential to see the bigger picture and see what the other people in your organization are struggling with so that you can find solutions and and help them and thus getting what you want in return. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. So we've been talking about how to coach up or maybe coach laterally so that you Mm -hmm. can get what you need to do your job well. And this is in that same vein, but sometimes it's not just about what do I need to be less stressed? People are also working in education because they want to see results with their students. They know my students need help across their day. So for example, for a therapist who is seeing a student in a situation where they might be pulled out of their classroom, they know I have 30 minutes a week with this student and I have this limited amount of time that I need to be able to teach them. And I want them to be able to take what I teach them and apply it to other settings. But in order to do that effectively, All these other people need to be on board. They need to be aware of what's going on here. And they might need to do something different in their classroom in order to make that happen. So that is, to me, a little bit different than just asking for things that you need to do your job well. To me, that's asking other people to change their habits and behaviors because you are concerned about the impact that you're making. So Mm -hmm. what thoughts do you have on that kind of coaching when it comes to, I might not be officially a coach, but I need to designate myself a coach for these other people who might need to be doing things differently in order for my students to be successful. Yeah. And this is especially challenging if, if that kid that you're working with is not going to make a big impact in their classroom and And so like, if it's a behavior problem, that's pretty easy. Yeah. You Uh don't, you don't want this kid goofing off, but if it's someone who is quiet or shy and doesn't want to talk, but they need to talk, then it can be much more challenging. And so what it comes back to again, is getting that bigger picture of what other people need to accomplish their jobs and finding ways to make it work for them to do the thing that you need done. And what this requires is you to step back from your position as I need this kid to speak more in class to what does this teacher need so that it'll be easy for her to have the student speak more in her class. We're going to take a quick break here because I wanted to mention a free training that's going to help you feel more empowered in your role as a school clinician or educator. One of the themes that we're talking about in this training is leading up, and another one is the concept of leading out. So this means that you are being a leader to people who might be your supervisor, and you're being a leader for people who are on your team that 
aren't necessarily directly reporting to you. This is so important if we're going to figure out how we can help students get the support that they need once they leave your therapy room. If you are a direct service provider, this concept is going to be critical to making sure that your therapy has the maximum impact that it can possibly have. And one of the most powerful ways that we can do that is by providing executive functioning support across students' day. But the challenge is knowing how to get everyone on board. Before we do that, we need to know what strategies need to be in place and what we're currently missing. And that's what I share in my free training for school clinicians called How to Deliver Social and Academic Support in a Way That's Evidence-Based and Neurodiversity Affirming. In this training, I share how you as a school clinician can be a leader in providing executive functioning support and how you can support your students' diverse needs in a way that's empowering and sets them up for success in adulthood. To learn more about this free training, you're going to want to go to drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash EF leadership. Again, that's drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash EF leadership. Now, let's get back to the interview. So let's let's take an, another situation where I had a an eighth grade history teacher who wanted to lecture like all day long every day, and the uh, the Alaska Native students in her class and the English language learners needed opportunities to respond, and that was something that I was pushing as the principal and the uh, the special ed teacher and the SLP and the ELL teacher got together and were like. This is a prime place for these kids to practice something. And we've got them practicing things in their other classes, but we happen to have this mass of students in here and we need them to, to be talking more. And so they went to the teacher and said, tell us about your class, tell us what you do. And she basically, I'm, you know, shortening this for sake of this conversation. Yeah. yeah. She basically said, well, uh, kids learn best by being lectured to, and this is how I do it. And I'm, you know, I'm not interested in changing. And what are you all here doing anyway? And they said, well, we, you know, we have these native Alaskans, we have these English language learners, and we have these, um, kids with speech issues and we need them to have more opportunities to talk in your class. And she's like, well, you know, that's just not how I work. And so you probably should go work in other places. So these teachers had to figure out how to get this woman to change what she was doing. And so they started offering suggestions of how they could help, how they could come into her class and provide support and maybe do some pull out coaching, some pull out tutoring for kids who were struggling in her class. Well, happens to be that all the kids who were struggling were all of the kids on their caseload. And so it made sense for them to get their minutes during that class. And so what they did is they would pull the kids out and work with the kids on, um, on doing the review for the tests that she would have so that they could be successful in, in her class. And by making the kids successful in her class, she started to see that these uh, these other teachers were doing something valuable that was working. And like all teachers, even those we disagree with, she wanted her kids to be successful. And so by meeting that short-term goal of these kids doing well on the assessment, they were able to then start making inroads to have her change the way she was doing some things and be able to coach her on how she could do five minutes at the end of class for kids to talk to each other and talk about what they learned during that lecture. Now, teaching via lecture, I don't think is the best way for kids to learn right. and had many discussions with her as the principal about that, but she wasn't willing to change until she saw how it benefited her. And so these teachers working with her were able to find a way to make things beneficial for her so that then she'd be more open to changing some other things. Side note, they were also working on the things that I wanted to happen as the principal, which made me give them more support and more encouragement to keep doing that work because it was working for my bigger vision as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. There's so many different things there that you brought up. The first thing is banding together with other people who are who are mm -hmm. on board with what you want to do so that you can 
divide and conquer, and also just divvy up some of those responsibilities and come up with different ideas. So I love that. I tell people to do that all the time. And also just the idea of compromising in order to, I guess, get your foot in the door as a, as a way to put it where sure. you are, you're accepting something that maybe isn't your end goal for the sake of getting to the next step. I think a lot of times people get frustrated where they have this idea of what they want. And if what they're getting isn't, isn't there, if it's maybe a small step in the right direction, that can be very frustrating because as you said, a lot of us know that lecturing students isn't the best way to do things. And a lot of people are frustrated just, well, it, the intervention needs to happen in your classroom, not me pulling the students out. But just the idea that just doing that and meeting her where she was at was what helped them to get to that next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I think the the real key there is we we have goals and ideas of things we want to accomplish. And too often we think the only way to do that is to do it all. Yeah. That's, that's not the case. We can have baby steps. We can take, you know, move an inch. And eventually those small things add up until they're so big that it's like an avalanche. And, and it does, it does make a difference and it does happen in small and simple steps. And that's, that's not a bad thing. And it's okay for that to, to take time, even though we feel a sense of urgency in education, a lot of the times, like yeah. Yeah. we got to get this done today. The reality is, is everything takes time and we don't have to worry so much about the timeline as we typically do. You know, even if a kid is going to be graduating and moving out of the system or moving out of your school, you can still be laying the groundwork because hopefully you're playing a longer game. And if we can get that particular eighth grade teacher to change her ways and give kids more opportunities to respond, that's going to be a net win for everybody. And so it's not going to happen because you force her to. It's going to happen because she feels like that's the right thing to do. And so it's about focusing on that bigger vision of where you want people to get to. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast a while back about this whole idea of getting buy-in. And I think it, the person who was talking, I can't remember exactly what book they were referring to, but just the whole idea that we think that we need to get buy-in or we think we need to get buy-in for the whole thing before we implement something. And that maybe that isn't true. Maybe we don't need to get buy-in. Maybe we need to just engage people in actions or the next step and let that buy-in come as a result. What are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. You, <laughs> we, we don't need to do that. Like we talk about having consensus or like getting everybody to buy in or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that it just needs to be safe enough to try which yeah. I got from a book called New Team Habits um, and really a great book about having a, a norm around something being safe enough to try. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but we just need to be able to try it. And what I think is really amazing about this idea is that if it's safe enough to try, then we can try it and be okay with whatever the result is. Mm -hmm. And so with that teacher, they did something that was safe enough to try. They said, let us come and talk to these kids and help them do better on your test during your class period. Um, that That's safe enough to try. She can handle that. The other teachers can handle that. So, so do something that is safe enough to try to just get started. And in action and success breeds more action and success. Yeah. And so if you, if you get a little step in the right direction, then somebody's going to say, hey, that worked out pretty well. Maybe we should do that again. <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and then it's very comfortable and easy to start to keep making those choices. Yeah. There's a lot of wisdom in that mindset with not just teachers, but also with kids who are resistant to try new things as well. Just mm -hmm. action and action breeds more action. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It really does in every situation. And what what gives people the strongest encouragement is success when mm -hmm. when they're when they see success with anything they're like that feels good i want to do that again even mm -hmm. if it was uncomfortable even if it was hard they still want that feeling of success again and so it's worthwhile to 
to continue doing that and give them more opportunities. And if you can put yourself in a position where they trust that the suggestions you're making are going to help them be more successful, then you're going to get a lot faster yeses and yeses a lot more often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the the thing that often is discussed in some of the clinical groups is, again, we all want to be in line with evidence-based practices. And in order to do that, you have to know, here are these research articles and here's what this research says. But if you come in to a meeting with this list of research and like all these bullet points and it's, this is what it says and this is what we have to do, then it it comes across like a list of demands, like you're, totally. like you're lecturing people and yep. kids don't like to be lectured to. Um, adults don't like to be lectured to. And so, yes, you do need to know the research. You do need to know your end goal, but getting there isn't about necessarily presenting the evidence, at least not in that way. And I know that that's what a lot of times the advice I see being given in some of these clinical communities. And then people are wondering, why doesn't anybody want to work with me? Why are people so resistant to what I'm suggesting? Well, a lot of times it's because that approach just isn't the best way to get to that next step and to, to get to the yes. Yeah. Uh, research is one of the most damaging things that we can do in education, not because research is bad, but because we weaponize it and make people think that if you don't agree with the research, then you're wrong. Now, here's the reality. If something is 95% good and 95% of the students found success with it, that's great. That's evidence-based. That's something that we want to implement. But the reality is, is that the 5%, 100% did not get positively impacted by that. So to that person, it 100% did not work. I don't care what the research says. It doesn't matter because for me, it didn't work. And so we put all this emphasis on research and evidence-based and all that kind of stuff. And the problem is, is that when it doesn't work, because it doesn't always work, then people feel jaded and they feel betrayed because the research, the science said that it should. So what we really need to do is we need to give people opportunities to experience the positives and the benefits of doing the things instead yes. of instead of telling them the research says this, therefore we're going to do it. And so, for example, early in my career, I was a, a, a curriculum specialist at a 30,000 student district. And we were going to implement some stuff by Anita Archer and some direct mm -hmm. instruction with that was quite highly scripted. Right. And, and like, nobody was excited about this <laughs> because uh, going from doing whatever I want to doing something scripted doesn't sound much fun to most people. And so it was a reading program that we were going to implement in the secondary schools. And it just did not look like fun. We gave teachers the opportunity to try it and feel it and see what it looked like. And that that was fine. But I don't think we did enough of that. And we implemented it and it didn't really work out very well. I I moved on to uh, to a school where I was principal and we had intervention and we had a a teacher who was doing um who was doing intervention and it was a scripted program and kids were moving along and it was great. And this other teacher came in and said, you know, I just don't feel like I can do that effectively. I need to bring my own flair to it and I need to bring my own personality to it and do some other things. And we said, okay, but we need to see that this is working. We're, we're happy to trust you. And, but we can't, we can't let you not do this curriculum because we know that it's working because kids are moving up uh, a whole grade level in a semester. And that's what we need because these kids are, are behind where we want them to be. And we can see that it's actually working. So she said, okay, I'll do that, but I'm going to spend the first 10 minutes of class every day doing some other stuff that I think is important. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, but don't forget, you got to do this program because it's actually working. So we had two teachers doing the same program, but one was taking 10 minutes to do something a little extra in the beginning and still trying to get kids to move a year in a semester. So here's what's amazing. <laughs> she, she was able to get the kids to move two years in a semester wow. very quickly. 
And within a quarter, we saw that her kids were outpacing the other one that was evidence-based. Now, the evidence-based scripted program was good and it worked and it was it was fine. But what this teacher was doing, her little something extra was adding in a lot. And what she was doing was, it was a math intervention. She was doing mindset work with the kids for the first 10 minutes of class. Now, we, this was before Joe Bowler was huge and we had those that mathematical mindsets book. Uh, we didn't know how this would work, but we trusted her because she really thought she could make a difference. And her kids were far exceeding the kids in the other class and were doing better in all of their other classes as well, not just in math class, in math intervention. And so what we saw there was that she was able to try something that we didn't have research for, that we didn't have evidence for, but we had evidence in her classroom of seeing what was happening and making those kids be more successful. And that is what mattered. And what she did to make sure we saw that was she had kids share their growth and their achievements without us having to go collect data on them. So they would come and share and say, hey, this is what I did in my math intervention class today. And it was awesome. And like having kids who struggle in school come and tell you as the principal that they're enjoying school and that they're liking it really does make you pay attention and think and recognize what's really going on. Now, she had had experience with Joe Bowler's Mathematical Mindsets book from her college education and knew some of these things already, but we didn't, as a school district, didn't have access to that information. So she had the evidence, but rather than saying, look, here's this book, read it, you'll see that I'm right, and you'll just let mm -hmm. me do it. She took small steps to implement things and be in a better position so that she could say, here's the evidence that you really want, which is the kids right in front of us. That matters a lot more than we give it credit for. The research, nobody's reading that. Nobody's paying attention to it except for nerds, which I say lovingly. Yeah. And the reality is, is me. that yeah, day-to-day <laughs> -day teachers don't really care because yeah. they're dealing with the kids right in front of them. And we need to get on the same level as them and show them how it's benefiting them right there. I think that with the research, everybody wants to, to know that they're doing the right things, but it is very hard to, to stay on top of it when you are thinking about all these other things, all the other, I would say soft skills or just there's things that need to come together for the application of that research to work. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with the evidence-based practices triangle that's sometimes in the I mean, so the idea of you have the you have the research evidence from peer reviewed studies, then you have the clinical practice or I would say teaching practice that is layered on top of that, where there is that flexibility with how you implement. And then there is the evidence that you get from actual people going through the program. So how how that all layers into it, I think, is what you're talking about here is where. Mm -hmm. The research is good. We need that. We need that to inform what we're doing, but we also need the actual practical uh, application of it. And I think that something that people who are very pro evidence based practice, or, or I guess something that's kind of a mindset shift is that, yes, you want to be aware of what the peer reviewed studies are saying, but when it comes to moving people and motivating them and, and really getting that emotional component that reading a textbook is different than hearing a student that's in your building say, I'm excited to come to school. It's just, it's a lot more compelling. And so I think it's really important to not be too black or white with how we apply it, because really you're not going to get to those emotionally compelling stories if you are too rigid with how you, how you reinforce it. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And I was not familiar with that evidence-based triangle. And so I would like you to share that with me oh, okay. so that I yeah. can I can see it and understand. Because that sounds like, I took a long time to explain what you explained in 30 seconds. So I'd yeah. like to learn and grow as well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this is something that is, it comes up in a lot of the clinical communities in on the American Speech Language and Hearing Association website. There is like, if you Google evidence-based practices triangle, it's something that comes up. And I know that other clinical areas have it as well. So there's this, when you're thinking about what evidence-based practice is, there's a lot of times people just go to the peer-reviewed studies, which of course is a really important component because you have 
controlled studies, you have bias that you're mitigating and all of those things. So you have that, those published studies is one leg of the triangle, but then you also have clinical experience, which I would say teaching experience would fall under that as well. So there's this direct clinical practice that is layered on top as another leg of the triangle, which is not just what does the research say, but how does this apply when you're, when you're working with real humans. And so one Mm -hmm. way that I've interpreted it as, okay, you know what this effective practices is, um, for example, like the, the framework of Archer and Hughes, where it is a little bit scripted, it's I do, we do, you do, and all of that. But then you might also know that that person needs something else. So maybe they do need some mindset work, maybe they do need something specific that's going to help them to get the full benefit of this other thing that you're doing and layer it together. So it's it's taking into account those individual differences and then also taking your experiences and applying it. So there's that um, evidence-based practices. So the peer-reviewed studies, um, your, your clinical expertise and experience. And the other one is the um, patient input or family input where There's something specific that has to do with that person's individual situation that's going to change how you apply whatever it is that you're doing. So one example that comes up a lot of times is that sometimes when you're recommending some kind of a treatment, there are certain things about that person's culture or family situation that you need to apply when it comes to how they how they apply that, where um, one example that came up with someone, uh, one of my colleagues. So she has a a son who has a lot of different sensory needs. He needs certain things where um, when he is eating, he needs a very, um, an environment that's supposed to be not very distracting. But then she has this huge family and she's saying, you know what, I'm not going to be able to feed him in a place that's not distracting all the time. So we need to figure out how to make this work for my family. So Mm -hmm. they need to take clinical expertise with, you know, what has worked, whoever's working with her needs to say, all right, um, what's worked with other patients that I've worked with? And what does the research say about how we would support this kind of thing? And then how we do, do we blend that based on how this applies to your family? And so I think that example with your teacher, she had the other experience uh, that she was applying it to. She also knew what worked for her kids in her classroom. And she was still using a framework that was based in evidence. So she had kind of the the trifecta there. So yeah, that's brilliant, man. I wish I would have known about that before I started talking. I could have explained that so much better. Well, but you did though, intuitively. (laughs) 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 And and again, this was more, I would say sometimes that example was a little bit more medical, but I think it, it applies to teaching as well. And and I think that it helps people to feel a little bit more empowered in the way that they're making decisions. So, yeah, for yeah. sure. That's good. Um, so I know we've been talking for a while and I, there are so many different other questions I could ask about coaching, but what other things are you working on now? Um, what are some shifts that you're seeing with just the idea of coaching or just trends in education? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to talk about really that, this idea of, of being able to level up ourselves Mm -hmm. so that we can meet the needs of everybody uh, around us and doing so in a way that like a lot of times, you know, people have this idea of there's a certain trajectory or path we need to go to, um, to move up in our careers and, and whatnot. And really, I think that the reality is that it's, it's much simpler and that, if we are constantly leveling up ourselves, then what we do day to day is not as as important as it may seem. And that if we are being our very best self and sh- and showing up in a way that's really powerful, then we're going to impact people's lives in ways that that we typically only dream of. And uh, and I and what I want to do is help people be able to do that and. I think a lot of people don't see the power that they have. And um, especially, you know, over the last few years, teachers just feel really beat up, you Mm -hmm. know, and I'm including service providers in that. And, you know, going from 
being in person to being virtual to sometimes virtual, sometimes in person with these different uh, services that we're providing. Like in Alaska, we've had virtual service providers for a long time because it's so hard to find yeah. qualified people mm -hmm. up in Alaska. So it's not like it's impossible to do, but it's a, a, a shift a lot of people have had to make and they weren't uh, totally prepared for it and didn't know exactly how to do it. And and the people that I'm seeing who are being the most successful have really been working on a lot of the things that we've been talking about here and are really leveling up themselves um, in a in a powerful way that that empowers them to to be a lot more in control than they've ever felt before. And people are increasingly feeling like they're not in control. And when you don't feel in control, you're stressed, you're uncomfortable, you feel like other people are making decisions for you. And I want to help people uh, figure out how to be more in control themselves and, and level up themselves in a way that, that is really powerful. Yeah. So what are some ways you're, you're doing that right now? What projects are you working on? Yeah. So I have this workshop series that is, um, launching May 2nd, uh, called, uh, move up and it's about moving up. And we focus on three things that we've talked about here, uh, showing up, leading up and leveling up. And if you do those things, then it's going to be much easier for you to move up. And and so if somebody wants to, they can go take a quiz and see if they're ready to move up. Now, this is specifically for people who are like looking to be principals, but the same the same principles LES apply that if you show up, lead up and level up, then you'll be able to move up to whatever your next step is. And so move up.transformativeprinciple.com is where people can go take that quiz and it'll give you a score of how ready you are to move up and tell you about the area that could use the most improvement. And then my workshop um, after that will help you figure out how to do those things in, in a way that, um, that is really personalized to you as an individual. And that's what I'm, what I'm really excited about right now. Yeah, that's, so I have been thinking about this for a long time where even if you aren't thinking that you want to be a building principal, if you are working in a school, if you're working with principals, if you're, if you're on an IEP team and you just, you feel like you are, not making the impact that you want, it is definitely to your benefit to understand, to talk with principals, understand what principals are dealing with, and just really get an insight to what their day-to-day -day looks like, and, and as well as the skills that they need to do their jobs well, because I think that that can be applicable to a lot of the roles in school systems, even if all you want to do, like for the rest of your career, you're like, I love where I'm at, I, I want to stay here, I just want to do it as you know, be as effective as possible in my current role. Well, that is that is exactly the key because moving up doesn't necessarily mean getting the principal job. Yeah. But it could be moving up in your influence. It could be mm -hmm. moving up in the impact that you have. It could be moving up in your ability to provide the services that you want to provide without people getting in your way of doing that. Um, I have a, a neighbor who lives close to me, who is an SLP. She's, uh, you know, in her mid to late forties. And is, this is, she was married for a long time, stay at home mom, did a couple businesses and then decided this is what she wanted to do. And so she is experienced in life, but not experienced in being an SLP. And she wants to be her best and do her best. And I want to help her do that because she has great potential she doesn't ever want to be a principal, but she does need to learn how to do these things that we've talked about on this, mm -hmm. on this show of how to persuade people, how to help them see the benefits, all that kind of stuff. And I think that it's really valuable for her to have an opportunity to do that and to see a different perspective um, so that she really can be as good as she possibly can be. How often do you find people who are just, they're just frustrated and they don't know what they want and they start working on these things and that either gives them clarity or makes them realize that they wanted a role that they didn't think was possible or that they didn't know that they wanted. How often yeah. does that happen? Well, it it happens a lot. People, people think that they are satisfied with where they're at 
And a lot of things like their mindsets about fear, about the unknown and how scary it could be, the saboteurs that are in their heads of Mm -hmm. thinking they're not good enough or not capable, those things come up a lot. And what I see most often is that people don't believe the power that they have within themselves to accomplish the things that um, that they think are for somebody else. And so I work with people a lot through this and we do a whole section on um, on the saboteurs in our heads and and how our, our weaknesses de- distract us from living up to our full potential. And those are the kinds of things that I get really excited about. And like I wove those things into this conversation as we were talking without saying them out loud and trying to say them in a way that people can get. But then I give you the language, like you gave me the language for the evidence-based triangle um, of of how to interpret it, how to talk about it, and how to make it actually work in in your day-to-day life. Before you sign off, don't forget to check out the Transformative Principle podcast at jethrojones.com and also check out the B Podcast Network. The show notes have all of the information for where you can connect with Jethro on his podcast as well as the other podcast hosts on the network of which I am a part of. Also be sure to check out the quiz in the show notes about how to level up in your career. And of course, if you want a tangible plan for leading up and leading out on your team, if you want to feel empowered now when it comes to getting your team on board with support across your student's day, then check out my executive functioning training about how to be evidence-based and neurodiversity affirming. Again, to sign up for that free training, you're going to want to go to drkarendudekbrandon.com backslash EF leadership. As always, thank you so much for listening, and I will see you in the next episode. <laughs>